and we're going to take probably 10 seconds for um, 10 or 15 seconds for introductions from folks, and then dive right into questions from the audience. Hi, I'm Emma Coates, and I'm um, the character personality lead for the Google Assistant. Hi, I'm Christine Marzano, and I'm the co-founder of a startup called DNA Block, and we are creating a toolkit to basically help and democratize content creation, avatar creation for everybody, so everyone can create their own. Hi, I'm Maggie Lane. I'm an interactive writer producer and member of the Interactive Academy. Um, I'm also the director of the Reality Code Alliance. I am Will Thompson, a uh, new newly found virtual beings enthusiast and uh, early stage frontier tech investor at a firm called Loop Ventures. Before we get started, uh, Will, why don't you just describe the assistant IQ test that you guys did? Sure. So uh, for a couple of reasons, we uh, set out to benchmark essentially the, the performance or utility of uh, the leading kind of uh, AI assistants. So uh, Google Assistant, Siri, Alexa, Cortana, for for some reasons, we've uh, eliminated that from our test. Um, and uh, uh, we've been doing it for the about three years. And I would say the average uh, performance, uh, to summarize, has basically um, improved from, on a standard grading scale, about a D minus to a B or a B plus, depending on the professor at the time. All right, well, let's, let's go to some questions um, from the audience. OK, and you'll have to speak up just so that we can hear. Yeah, no worries. So <clears throat> really, for, for Will, um, what criteria are you measuring? What are your metrics? Um, OK, we're basically testing two things, right? Just uh, voice recognition and then its uh, ability to deliver a correct answer. So one is, it did it understand the question? Um, and that we've almost considered stopping um, re to record that because w within reason, if you are in a controlled environment, you speak uh, without background noise and you speak clearly and you give it a chance, it will understand, you know, all three of the leading assistants will understand almost everything that you say to them. Um, w you know, less than 1% of, of queries um, are misunderstood. The second, uh, introduces a layer of, of um, subjectivity there that we try to uh, eliminate by um, kind of explaining our criteria as to what is a correct or a useful answer. And for that, we kind of uh, do a lot of survey work on how people use these things. And then we design basically questions that, uh, to the best of our knowledge, are, um, are commonly asked or um, you know, comprehensively test what we understand that, that, that people are, are, are using these things for in their everyday lives. Hmm. All right, what about another question? Okay, we'll go there. Hi there, my name is Greg Panos. Um, I'm interested in the virtual immortality aspect of what's been discussed. So I used to have a lot of high hopes about it, but since the political situation has changed, people are very suspicious of online social networks, which seem as if they're the richest repository from which we can mine personal information to simulate ourselves and to create our own virtual storytelling machines. What do you think the, that's going to have an effect on the, the traction or the friction of this industry moving in a direction whereby uh, we can leave behind avatars or persona forms or other versions of ourselves to tell our real life story. Will people trust these platforms to obtain and properly utilize this information, or will they become suspicious and hmm. hesitate and not want to do that? Maggie. I have a dramatic answer to this question. Um, my sister, uh, before committing suicide two years ago, left a video on Facebook. Uh, declaring that she was going to kill herself from a heroin overdose, which she then did. We asked Facebook, and also my uh, brother-in-law is a data scientist at Facebook, to please remove that video. It has still been unsuccessful. They will not do it because she consented and was over 18 at the time to leave that video up. There's no way to get rid of it. 
So there's so many benefits of having a legacy. I mean, I, <sighs> but because people like things like that will never be erased, I, it, it pains my parents, it pains my family, and there's nothing we can do. So that's the darker end of it. So I, things like hereafter sound amazing as long as it's consensual, but something that the rest of the family, it just becomes a painful wound. Hmm. What about uh, other questions? All right, over here. It seems like there's a bifurcation of objectives between chatbots that, where we measure their performance by the suspension of disbelief about them, and assistance where we measure their performance by correct answers or even correct execution of tasks. What do you think about that? Emma, do you want to take yeah. that one? Um, yeah, I think that that's really interesting. Um, yeah, you can't measure something that's not um, trying to do something correct, right? Like, so I think that the suspension of disbelief is a like quantifiable metric that you can use. Um, but I think in a lot of, um, I mean, like virtual performers, um, so much of a performance comes from uh, an actor's or a singer's point of view um, and what they bring. And that's very hard to quantify, right? Mm. Um, so I think we're measuring what we can at this point. Yeah, anyone else for that question? Will, do you want to? This is somewhat related, but I, I want to um, propose the idea that um, the quote unquote success of smart speakers measured by call it, you know, installed base, they've had pretty dramatic success. Uh, I don't know if anyone would disagree with that. Um, has kind of both hurt and helped the the broader kind of like space of virtual beings, let's say. For one, it's given you a channel uh, to bring a bunch of what everyone has talked about today into your house. I mean, a, a shocking percentage of people have these things sitting on their counter or at least have access to one. On the other hand, to what you're saying about measuring performance versus suspension of disbelief, um, I think a lot of people have maybe their first interaction with a virtual being on their smartphone asking mm -hmm. Siri a question or on, the, on Alexa. They ask, you know, what was the score of the Rangers game? Siri says, here's what I got from a Google search. They say, oh, Siri sucks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she gets the question wrong or, or what have you. And they, be, they grow less and less interested in, in dealing with, you know, they say, okay, I'm just going to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's both an opportunity and, you know, a double-edged sword. Um. I'm just going to add that I think people are really mean to virtual beings, and I wonder, especially because there are women on this panel, um, so many are female and we're calling them stupid and yelling at them all the time. Uh, Alexa's stupid. Siri's stupid. Um, I know Siri can be male. Um, and I wonder what kind of effect that will have. That's kind of a larger question about how should we be treating virtual beings? Should we be upset with them, angry with them, impatient? Does that help them learn? And what kind of like reflections does that have in society? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just, just hearing that question and, and what you're saying, Maggie, it makes me think about a couple of things. One is um, Micah from Magic Leap wrote an, an excellent blog. This is a virtual being that uh, Magic Leap created. And she said in this blog, um, possibly written for her, but who knows. Um, <laughs> but the person who wrote it is, is a great genius. Um, she said, I'm not gonna, don't ask me to turn on and off your music for you. I'll be the one writing the music, which I th used to think was very profound and true. But more recently, I've been thinking that maybe we shouldn't have such a bifurcation around um, this is uh, an assistant type task. And there were a lot of talking points in the last 18 months around like, we don't want these virtual beings to be servants. It's terrible. We want them to be our friends. And there's a real distinction between these things. And as I've been thinking about that and observing my own behavior, 
actually, I ask my housemate to do things all the time. And they are all mundane things like, oh, could you get the lights? Could you close the fridge? Could you turn up the volume? Can you turn it down? Can you turn it on? Can you turn <laughs> all the set a timer? Can you get the potatoes? That's like totally normal. And I don't, th I used to think, oh, we should just keep the assistant stuff totally to the side. That would be very demeaning to the virtual assistant, to, to the virtual being. Um, but actually we do that all the time. And I wonder if a solution to what you're talking about as well is what Pete was saying around codependence in that just as I might ask the virtual being to read my kids a story, a bedtime story, they might also say to me a week later, hey, we've got date night. Do you mind including the kids in, when you read the bedtime story to your kids, do you mind including our kids as well? Um, and that sense of mutuality, which sort of is true. If I'm always asking my housemate to do things, he's gonna get very frustrated after a while. Um, but that doesn't mean I should never ask him to do things. It just means there should be a mutual um, trade of um, obligation and, and codependence. So I, I, yeah, that's that's just where both of those questions took me. I don't know, Christine, what, what do you think about the, the questions Maggie asked and that question as well? Well, the majority of what we're doing is real-time performance-based. So we want people to be able to capture their performance and put it into an avatar that they're creating. So we are using some AI capabilities, but we're not creating these totally, you know, AI beings that are living by themselves. We still want to have that human element inside of them, people driving them, and that's what we think will make for interesting content. And we think it'll go onto all of these different platforms because that's what people are doing right now. They want to create content. They want their voice to be heard no matter what it looks like. And millennials and all the younger generations now, they do have this idea of like, fluid identity, whether it's gender or, or whatever the identity is. And we want to allow them the tools to be able to create these characters and create fun, engaging content with it. So for us, it's not as much of what will you tell this AI assistant to do? It's what will someone do when given the tools that to this point have been prohibitively expensive? What kind of content will they create? And I'm sure it'll open up a whole world of content with voice. And Emma, when you think about Google Assistant, I mean, does do you guys think about how Google treat how people treat Google Assistant? Is that a kind of I am not subject of debate? Nice to mine. Right. Yeah. Do, is that a thing you guys discuss and talk about and worry about, or or is that something that's more up to each user and you feel you shouldn't get involved? Um, well, it's definitely up to each user um, how they treat it. Um, you know, it's. It's a product to. Um... It's a virtual being, Emma. <laughs> it's a virtual being and a product. Um, we don't really have plans for you to ask it, no, for it to ask you to turn off the lights. Um, <laughs> to answer that question from before. Um, yeah, I think. I think. Uh, We've had some features in the past, um, something where it'll uh, do what you ask it if you say please, mm. um, was one that we um, put together. So it's optional, you opt into it, but. Um, and did that seem like a good idea, or did that, what do you think personally, like emphasizing politeness and we should say please and thank you, or do you think that's just irrelevant? I think it's a great option to have. Mm. Um, you relate differently to different people, I mm. think, yeah. Mm. All right, another question. Possibly our last, probably our last. Probably, yeah. Oh, look, he's very excited. Okay. <laughs> Speak up. The world up. is a scary place, but I'm still hopeful that the future is nice. So um, I want to ask each of you if you could create any virtual character to interact with, either for you or someone you know, what that character would be. Oh, I like that. What a great final question. That's beautiful. Excellent. Uh, who, can, who, who wants to go first? He's got an idea. I'd really like a virtual uh, Mr. Rogers to interact with. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a thing for Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. So uh, Humphrey Bogart, you take me on dates, it'd be romantic. <laughs> for me, I don't think it would be one character. I think it would be a character that I could change daily depending on my mood and how I felt. Yeah. Um, I think 
Mine would be assistive, um, something that could remind me and never get tired of reminding me to do um, mundane things. <laughs> um, I was just cycling through. I think since I like the media side as well as this OS side, I think I'd like the, the group from Frasier because I could sometimes watch them <laughs> and just chill. And sometimes I could interact with them, depending on how I was feeling. Which is all it's like six characters. No, all right, I guess a bulldog. You would cut things off at bulldog, and that would be the... All right, thank you so much, everybody. This has been wonderful, and we're going to have some cocktails. <laughs>